and it's recording. Okay. Greetings, people of Earth. <laughs> um, I did say six, and we've got like another minute or two to go, so we can wait until then. It's so bizarre <laughs> seeing stuff on, like, just live. Oh, well. Okay. Oh, come on, it's, it's... Why is it not working? It was working yesterday. Ah, oh, it's working. You hear the sound uh, quietly enough for it to be vaguely sinister. <laughs> okay, we're live on Twitch. Um, should we just ping our Discord very quickly? I was just about to do that. Grand. Six people currently viewing. Cool. Um, should we wait for some more or should we start now? Um, let's give it a couple more minutes until people um, arrive, just because some right. people might have trouble um, getting on Twitch and logging in and stuff. Yeah, that's true. And we've only just posted the reminder yeah. on the announcements, so that'll be fine. And because gamers. Mm. Gamer time, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But also, um, I think one thing that might be worth flagging up just for whilst everyone's coming in, if you're new to GMing and you're not sure whether you'd want to get into it, you're, in the, you're at the right place. And if you're suddenly inspired by this workshop to want to GM, then we are looking for GMs with one shots tomorrow. So you can always chuck your hat in the ring and run a game tomorrow at Gears. It'll be fun, we promise. Spooky. <laughs> Also, a part of that uh, that uh, havering was just to check how long of a latency there is between the Zoom call and the Twitch. Okay. So I think the Twitch lags by about three or four seconds. Right. Yeah, I've just checked out as well. Which would give us time to beep out swearing if well, we knew how to do it. <laughs> Sorry to yeah. be a dinosaur. Twitch, what's that? That's the website where the workshop is being broadcast live. Okay. <laughs> Cool. So, um, how many? So it seems we have thirteen people watching, which is nice. Um, so, as always, welcome everyone. You can post in the chat to let us know you're here. We don't know who the thirteen people are. We just know that you're there. Also, I think we are required to say this for copyright reasons. Um, the music is Tavern Music by Tabletop Audio. It's licensed under Creative Commons. Um, Tabletop Audio are an amazing website that provide free music for Tabletop RPG online streams and stuff. Check them out, they're amazing. And um, yeah, their music is great fun. Uh, music and ambience and sound effects. Well, so should we get started now? Yep. Okay. Um, hi everyone, welcome to the first GM workshop. Uh, it's a bit different this year because obviously everything's now online, but should be fun. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, hi, I'm Emma. I'm the events organizer for this year. Um, and I will introduce our panelists as well. So we'll start with Vivek. Okay. Um, oh, great. I can't hear people for this this time. Hi, everyone. My name is Vivek. I'm the quality and well-being officer at Gears, and I've been GMing for a few years. I'm currently running three games at Gears, which is increasingly starting to feel like a very bad idea. Stephen, do you want to go next? Yeah. Uh, hi, I'm Stephen. Um, I've been GMing for probably about 25 years now. Um, I've always been G GMing at Gears, at least one game a year, sometimes more. Um, that's it, as far as I can tell. Let's see what I'm going to say anything else. That's perfectly fine. Yeah. And then Craig, if you want to introduce yourself. Hello, um, I'm Craig. I've been um, GMing for even longer than that. Um, Yay, the great uh, old one. <laughs> uh, but, uh, you know, I 
I still get stage fright. So, you know, some things never change. <laughs> Okay, so these are all the lovely gems who have volunteered to be here today and we're really thankful for you guys. Um, and today we're just gonna be doing some questions about the basics of gemming. So if you've never gemmed before or if you're thinking about gemming for the first time, we're just gonna be covering some basic questions. Um, so we'll dive right into it. So the first question we've got is, how do you decide which system to choose? So what would you recommend when you pick a system to run as a game? Um, Craig, we'll start with you. Okay, uh, well, um, first thing you need to think of is, do I understand this system? Because mm -hmm. there are plenty of systems that I don't understand. And even if there, you do understand the system as a player, you may not necessarily be able to run it. Because there are systems of varying degrees of complexity from, I mean, this is the first game I ran. And which is the original fighting fantasy uh, game. And you know, not only is it a tiny little paperback, this is the actual amount of game, and these are the sample adventures. You know, it has three stats, which are determined three statistics, skill, strength, and, uh, no, hang, skill, stamina, and luck, which are determined by rolling two six-sided dice. So you can have generated a character in the time I start, since I started talking. Uh, but at the moment, I'm running. <clears throat> The new edition of Vampire the Masquerade, which is 400 pages long, and that's 200 pages less than the last edition. Fair enough. So definitely understanding the system, not only just as a player, but like from the rule point perspective as well then, yeah? Yeah, yeah that, that is right. the first thing. Um, the second thing is um, you have to look at how much you're going to run the game. I mean, there are games mm -hmm. which are designed to be run for one shots. And there are games which are designed to run for years and years and years and years. Um, and also look at your audience. And there are games which are meant for one player, which is not very helpful when there's 80 players at Gears. But also, um, you know, if you want to guarantee that you can get players, you can always run Dungeons and Dragons. But um, I personally can't get my head around running Dungeons and Dragons, which is. Uh, one thing I cannot do for Gears, I'm sorry. So, um, yeah, so familiarity with the system, um, comfort with the system and, and the setting and look at your audience. Those are the, are the main things I would say. Okay, uh, okay. Um, Stephen, would you add anything to that? Or what would you say um, is an important thing to consider when you pick a system? Um, I'd more or less concur with, with my learned colleague there. Um, yeah, I was more or less going to say the same thing. I mean, I, from personal experience, can say that um, for the first half of this year, I was running a game called Agone, which was hellishly difficult. And although it's a great setting, and the players also know, we like a setting, we like all that, actually to run it was a nightmare, especially online. Um, comparing it with a game running on, on Sunday afternoons now, um, it's like chalk and cheese. Uh, the cipher system is super straightforward, super streamlined, super easy. And I, as a GM, personally can't cope with complexity too far. So, um, yeah, figure out what kind of human being you are and run games which you can run is, is the best thing to do. Because if you try and, if you try and take... Like, I'm like Craig, I'll never run D&D &D ever again. I ran it once and it was a disaster and it terrified me. I'll happily play it, but I'll never ever run it. Um, Fair enough. <laughs> yeah, I think that's all. Okay, and Vivek, would you add anything else? Yeah, um, so, you know, like the other said, um, gauging what kind of system you are comfortable with playing is important. Um, one thing I'd add to that is also um, system matters when it comes to telling a story. Think about what kind of system works best for the kind of story you're telling, um, because all kinds of subtle details in the system, like the kinds of mechanics it has for things like social interactions or uh, inter-party conflict or PVP conflict or 
uh, PVE conflict, like, these little details will um, basically determine what kind of content your system can generate and what kind of interactions at the table are incentivized. So for example, I, am, I love running masks because it is a great system that has very fine grained mechanics to cover players bickering amongst each other. And if you want a game that incentivizes players bickering and, you know, people sacrificing each other's pets for to save their family and stuff, um, that's the kind of game to run. But at the same time, um, you know, I can see something like D&D being really good at very granular mechanical storytelling. So, for example, if you're fighting a um, if you're fighting an Aboleth and Aboleths have abilities to mind control and contaminate water then the legendary and layer actions of the Aboleth really reflect that and the granularity of the mechanics start to reflect the storytelling. Um, so it, it depends on what kind of story you want to tell and make sure you pick a system to do what the system does rather than twist it into different shapes. Um, for example, D&D is very heavily a combat dungeon crawl. Running social encounters in D&D basically comes down to talking over each other and then rolling persuasion at the end, which isn't really a social mechanic compared to some other systems like Hillfolk or Masks, which really mechanize social interactions very well. So think about that. What kind of game you want, what kind of story you want to tell, and how the system maps onto those story beats. Brilliant. And that actually runs really nice into our next question, which is how do you come up with the storyline for your games? So would you communicate with the players about maybe what direction you want to take? Or would you get inspiration from somewhere like TV or whatever. Vivek, we'll continue with you because you were talking about that just then. So um, I've been running a lot of Power by the Apocalypse games recently. And the answer to that question is I don't come up with a storyline. Um, part of Power by the Apocalypse and the design principle mm. of it is players improvise the story in the background. And then the GM basically just uh, tosses the ball around and spotlights different PCs, backstories and stuff. Um, so I've been playing a lot of games that have improved, that have relied on improvising quite a lot. And my personal feeling is I prefer improvising more than I prefer coming up with a storyline. I did do a summer campaign where I had to come up with a storyline myself when I was running Quest. And honestly, I don't enjoy that nearly as much because in my opinion, six people at a table are going to be far more creative than I can be. So I'd much rather improvise that way and have a session zero where the PCs create the world. And then when I GM, I bring up elements of the world that PCs create as part of a bigger story. Fair enough. So it's a lot of teamwork then between the GM and the players then. Yeah. Fantastic. Okay. Craig, what about you? Um, how would you come up with a storyline for your games? Um, this is going to be the unhelpful it depends answer. But it, okay. um, there are uh, games where you know going in with pretty much a blank page and knowing uh, basic expectations is fine. Then there, there are games where there's a massive amount of um, setting material and pre-published adventures that you can run from. And there are games where, you know, it's based on something like Star Wars, where everyone knows what kind of adventures they can have. Although they'll probably disagree on, you know, can I play a Jedi? No, you can't play a Jedi. <laughs> And it also uh, depends from players with players as well. You know, there are players who very much want to go. I I want uh, to be able to do this, and uh, can I do that? And uh, and there are also players who you know want to turn up and go. I want to hit the monster. And you know, and there are certainly days when I just want to go. And, you know, I want to hit the monster myself. You know, um, and you know this is better with you with some games, some groups, and others. You know. Um, um, I will, you know, draw inspiration from as many places as possible. I like to steep myself as much as possible into um, how a specific setting works. If I'm running something based on a licensed property, I will watch the thing. I will read the thing. Um, but I will also, you know, very much ask and check and see what the players want want to do and what they want their characters to experience. Like at the moment with uh, with Vampire, they have ambitions for their characters. And, you know, these can be both in and out of character. You know, if your character's ambition is, I want a quiet life, your player it probably doesn't want that <laughs> to actually happen. Mm -hmm. Although I have met players who have, and that's very strange. <laughs> but <laughs> they'll probably have um, something that they absolutely want to see happen and you'll have to 
discuss how how that advances or doesn't. So, yeah, I mean, absolutely, um, the players are, and particularly enthusiastic players who will, will bring ideas to the table, are absolutely the, the main thing that you can draw from, but you also have whatever it is that you're running and what it's based on as well. Fair enough, sir. And Stephen, how do you come up with the storyline for your games? Um, usually uh, I come up with a seed idea. Um, so, um, for example, the, the current campaign I'm, I'm running, um, I came up with the basic idea. I'm not going to say it out publicly here because mm. obviously I'm a smart player might be watching. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, I came up with, like, okay, this is what I think is going on. And then I sort of um, listened to what people were saying to me when they're creating their characters as well. And, so, and that, that's something I, I, I do for most of the games I run. Is, is a player says to me, oh, I want to play a, a monster hunter and I want, and I want to chase uh, the great gerbil lord. Well, then it's up to me to come up with stats for a, for a great gerbil lord and at some point sneakily introduce this as um, ferocious rodent into the uh, story. Um, so yeah, like Craig said, if you if you have players who contribute, I mean, it's, the name of the game is interactive storytelling, really, isn't it? Yeah. So I can come up with so much, uh, and then the other half of the equation comes from the players. There's nothing worse than a table of people sitting or lumpenly just staring at you, saying, "Feed me, feed me." Because I, I, I can only do my bit, which is like, okay, here's my story. How do you react to it? Um, yeah. I have very little time to, to, to prepare games. So <laughs> if I can go in there with three pages written down of what I think will generally happen and like refer to that uh, as a kind of roadmap that the players actually produce, produce the details. I've, I've, I've run campaigns where, where we started wasn't anywhere near where we finished and it was all down to the players saying oh let's do this let's do that so and that's great when that happens just, so i think oh sorry uh, no vivek you go just to follow up on what stephen and mm -hmm. uh, craig said about this about talking to your players i think there's another there's a flip side to this as well um it's not just the storyline that you come up with but also the storyline that all the players work together mm. to collaborate because you as the GM will often have an editorial role in what kind of stuff happens at the table. So in some respects, it's, incum it's incumbent upon us when, when GMing to listen to everyone and facilitate the kind of story that's coming out and making sure that everyone's happy with it. So if you have players who have very different ideas of what's going to happen, for example, if someone wants to you know, play a, um, um, an outlaw murder hobo who wants to go and you know, straight up uh, resort to violence to re solve a problem, whereas someone else wants to pursue a peaceful diplomatic solution, um, as a GM, it's important for us to be able to make sure we can reconcile these differences between players and come to a compromise between everyone and make sure we're okay with the direction the overall story is going. Um, because as much as we do tend to improvise or write our own stories, it's also important for us to realize that at some level, we are facilitating the story that the table is coming together on. So we need to mediate between players as well in terms of the story that they're improvising. Yeah, that's a really good point. So I think, Everyone said very similar things there. So it's more of um, when coming up with a storyline, it's more of like a conversation then between the GMs and the players to kind of sort things out. And then from that point, it just goes wherever it goes then. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Okay. So when you're planning a session then, what's the first thing that you do in preparation for it? So um, what would you say is the most important thing to know or to have with you right before a session as you're planning it? Uh, we'll start with Stephen this time. Um, the first thing, uh, bluntly, obviously, is read the rules, understand the rules, get your head around them as much as you can, which is another reason why, why, why simple is good. Um, second, uh, if there is a setting, uh, Make, make sure you have have an understanding of that. Third, work out what kind of um, session you're going to have. Are you going to have uh, an investigative session? In which case, you're going to have the the clues laid out and what it's going to take to get the clues. 
and plan B or C or D if the players walk past all the clues. If there's going to be fighting, uh, combat, uh, obviously you have your, your monster stats um, in front of you and make sure that that, 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 that works. Uh, and then um, you have a large um, glass of juice or uh, beverage of some sort mm -hmm. and um, <laughs> you get stuck in a fight basically. Fantastic. Uh, <laughs> I, okay. think, I think that's I think that's it yeah. <laughs> okay uh, what about you Craig what would you say is something important to have like in preparation for a session? Okay. Well <clears throat> Uh, I always advise that you uh, prepare for what you're not good at improvising. Like, if you can't come up with um, the statistics for monsters and what they can do on the fly, write that down. If you can't come up with names for names for non-player characters, which I can't, come up with a list um, on the fly because it will be very obvious when you know. Uh, ah, you were expecting me to introduce Marius the Ancient. You weren't expecting me to introduce Bob. <laughs> yeah. Or Bob. Or his brother Bob. <laughs> um, you also, um, once you've gone past the first session, look over, look over the notes of, if you've made notes, um, and see what people are saying about what happens. You know, to keep try and keep things somewhat consistent. You know, if you've got a, a rough plan of what they're expecting to do this week, then at least look at that even if you're not going to run with it. Fair enough. Mm -hmm. And then, Vivek, what would you say is one of the first things that you do when you prep for a session? Uh, wait, prep? What's that? Uh, oh, uh, um, like prepare, but, yeah. like... I know, yeah. I know, I was being facetious. Oh my um, god. So, <laughs> like I said, um, <laughs> Like I said, I do tend um, I do tend to improvise, and like Craig, I also believe in preparing the things you can't improvise. Um, I mentioned Powered by the Apocalypse games at the start, and I think they're a great place to start in terms of knowing what to prepare, um, because all Powered by the Apocalypse games come with a list of um, GM moves. Basically, in Powered by the Apocalypse, when a player fails a roll, the GM is allowed to retaliate by making a move. And those moves are often very powerful and very dramatic. For example, in Masks, if a PC fails a role, the GM has a move that says kidnap. You can literally kidnap the PC or the PC's loved ones because they're all superheroes and having their loved ones kidnapped and then having to rescue them is a common plot point. So um, Powered by the Apocalypse games have very nice lists that give you um, things you can do to add complications to the story. And having those lists as a ready reference is great because then you can look at the list find something and then improvise off of that. Um, having lists of names is great. Having, um, uh, um, yeah, and just generally having all the characters backstory notes so you know what kind of things to reintroduce like um, X nemesis from someone's backstory comes in and becomes a recurring character and stuff. Um, so it's really useful to have all of that information. Um, and these are of course for games that are very sort of story focused and mechanically quite light, the kinds of games I prefer playing. Um, but, you know, I do enjoy the kind of very crunchy mechanical, mechanical games from time to time. And that's where I think the prep I need to do for that is significantly harder. So if I'm running D&D &D and I'm running a combat encounter, then I would quite obviously have to have all the stats and everything prepped in advance. Um, but this is something that gets easier the more familiar you get with the games. The more familiar you are, the more experience you have under your belt, the quicker it is for you to improvise and just make stuff up on the fly. Um, and there's a very useful resource I found called The Song of the Blade, which is a blog post about running D&D 5th edition, where someone has actually done a statistical analysis of D&D and broken down the constitutive elements of all the stat blocks to four basic principles on how to come up with monsters. Uh, and it basically gives you a very um, simple way of improvising what the monster stats would be based on the number of players and the level of the party you've got. Uh, I'll post a link to that in the chat later. Um, but yeah, so resources like that can make it uh, can make it easier because you no longer have to have the exact stat block ready. You can just make the stats up on the fly at the table once you're there and respond to this because the worst thing that can happen to you is you prepare this massive encounter and then as Steven says, the players just walk around it. Um, but yeah, the one thing mm -hmm. that the, la and the most important thing to prepare for is having all your prep chucked out the window because that always happens. Yeah. No Sounds like a good point there. <laughs> okay, so I think from that we go, um, having a good understanding of the rules is very good. 
list of names right next to you is also very good. And improvisation can be your best friend. And when it's not, make sure you've prepared for that. Fantastic. Okay. So on the topic of having notes there, during a session, how do you keep track of what is happening? Would you take notes then or would you wait till the end of the session? How would you go about doing this? Um, we'll start with Craig this time. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I am a fairly heavy and rather compulsive note taker. Um, and, you know, the, for me, the tricky part is being able to read my notes once I'm done. Yeah, <laughs> I'm pretty sure that well, language is actually six, <laughs> um, um, which is this has actually uh, been improved by this is one of the advantages of um, online distancing, which is, uh, you know, I have a keyboard right here. It's, you know, um, it's it's um, I will sometimes just um, sit back and listen to the players um, talking in character and it's arguing and you know, note down what they say that is um just or more funny i have uh, previously you know written sort of script like transcripts of games which took me about as long to knock it into a form that you know people could read as running the actual session you know for then for the entertainment of literally some people maybe more maybe maybe several but you know, it's nice to be able to look back and you know, I've, I've had um, recently had players from a game that I ran 10 years ago here who's like, oh, we've been looking back at this. This was great. I was like, oh, wow, thank you. That's really shocking, but thank you. But yes, anyway, yes, I take notes. Um, and bullet points are helpful and relative legibility is also very important. Some good key points right there. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so Vivek, do you take notes during the session or how do you kind of keep track of what's going on throughout the story? So my note taking has gotten um, shoddier and shoddier as time goes on. Um, and that's, and I realize this um, through experience that I become, I, I don't really rely on my notes as much because one thing I've noticed is what is important to you as a GM is very different from what is important to the players. And what is different for what is important to player one will be very different to what's important to player five and a half. Like very different people, I mean, different players have different versions of, of events. And I, I really like playing into that. So increasingly, I rely not on my own notes, but on the player's recap or flashback of what happens, uh, which is why I tend to um, outsource this to the players a little bit and ask them to recap what happens at the end of the session. And I make note of the recap that they give me because that is often the more relevant details that sticks out to the players. And then the next week, I ask them for another recap of what happened in the previous week um, so that I remember what stuck in their minds and what is important to them. Um, and um, then I know what I can use to improvise in that session. I mean, of course, there's some things that I obviously take notes of, like if I introduce someone who is intended to be an important NPC, or if my player introduces someone just as a joke and I want to make that joke come back and bite them, I write those things down. But in terms of plot points, I find it much easier to be more um, free flowing and loose to the, about that because different plot points might be important to different players in ways that I hadn't previously realized. That's a really interesting point there. So, oh, Craig, did you want to say something? Um, yeah, um, it also varies from game to game. Um, like if, you know, a, a game is about a long, complicated conspiracy where basically one plot will be running for the entire year, you have to take more notes mm -hmm. than if you're doing a Planet of the Week um, Doctor Who game, where when you, the TARDIS lands, anything that happened last week doesn't matter. <laughs> Can until the that. Daleks turn up at the end of the season. You can always count the Daleks. Yeah. <laughs> um, Stephen, Dalek. how do you keep track of what's going on in a session? Do you take notes or what kind of method do you use? Um, well, um, what, what I do is, is I keep notes. Mm -hmm. um, and it's basically, oh, that name came up. I'll take, take a note of that. Um, they deviated from the plan in this direction. I better take, take a note of, of that. Um, little, little things like that. My my handwriting is horrible, probably a bit as bad as Craig's. Um, so it's not meant to be legible to anyone else. It's just meant to be a, a memory job for me. But I, I will also come back to players the following week and ask them to recap. And what I've no, what I've seen other people do 
as a particularly good idea, uh, and I wish that I could have thought about it, is um, take 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 a, a recap of a session, type, type it up immediately afterwards, and put it in Google Docs, and they put it up as a recap. Uh, one of my one of my friends, who's a, a, a very experienced GM, he's been do, doing it a lot longer than me. He's, he's the first person I played with, basically. He does that, and it's it's fantastic because he's running this pretty complicated three three or three and a half musketeers kind of campaign right now for all for one, and all sorts of things are happening. All sorts of weird French names are, are coming up and all that. So it's it's good to go back before a session starts and read and read through that. Um, so yeah, I know a couple of people who who will actually write write out, uh, type out uh, a full recap, full synopsis of of what happened previously, and they'll post that to other players, and that's good. And I wish I was I was sufficiently organised and had enough time in my life to actually do that. But um, I don't. What I do is is I scroll out some notes. Uh, I then come to players the next week and say, okay, so what happened last week? And if what they say doesn't agree with what I've got written down, I'll say, oh, and this happened as well, just to, to remind you. And that's kind of what I do. Like, like, I mean, I've got, I just, I just ran out um, of room in my last notebook on, on Wednesday when I was playing in the um, Wuja game. Um, and that was... I was literally writing in the in the back cover. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so I guess what we can gather from this yeah. is the longer you are a GM, the worse your handwriting will be. No, Does my that sound about right. No, no, no. I've got developmental disorders. My handwriting was always awful. <laughs> First. Well, there is. Um, I mean, I've I'm just to speak to what Stephen and Craig were saying. I think mm -hmm. I've got a practical solution to this supposed problem. Um, so a lot of games I've been playing have built-in recap mechanics, and those that don't, I graph those mechanics in it as well. Mm -hmm. um, because one thing that really helps is when the game mechanics has a built-in downtime for you to do a recap of the session. Um, because basically that means you spend the last 15 minutes of a game session uh, going over what has happened. And rather than having to do that in your own time at home, you can use the time you have at the table to do that. Um, and that really helps because from my experience, the time that you spend in, um, you know, not doing the story, but recapping what happens in a session goes a long way in making sure that you can um, enjoy the story to a much greater detail in the future. So you're not actually wasting time by turning the camera away from on camera action and doing the recap thing. And a lot of different games have these recap mechanics built into them, like the Blades in the Dark system, for example, has designated downtime where you've got to deal with the consequences of what happened and then go over the crime entanglements that happened as a re result of your action in the session. Um, so it might be worth looking at different systems that have built in recaps um, that help with note taking or, you know, adapting existing games that don't have these mechanics so you can implement those mechanics yourself. Um, but at the very least, it comes down to just taking the last 10, 15 minutes in a session a, as a dedicated time for everyone to update their notes and catch up on what happened. Hmm. It, it, it also uh, helped to make sure that um, the players have been paying attention. Good point. Um, so I guess because we've been talking a lot about how the story is definitely a conversation between the GM and the players and from note taking as well, it's important that the players also know what's going on. So how do you communicate with your players then to make sure that everyone's happy and know, knows what is going on? Uh, Vivek, we can start with you. Yeah, um, I mean, communicating with players is the thing that um, I, took me the longest to learn um, because for the longest time, I didn't realize that, you know, it's just okay to just take a break and talk about what's happening out of character and make sure everyone's on the same page. Um, and yeah, that's um, what I normally do is try and... Um, reinforce to the players what's what the what something looks like out of character so for example if a player is about to um the, i'm not trying to call anyone out deliberately here but say for example a player is trying to um trade another pc's pet as ransom for something um evil killer aliens are doing um then i just flag up that all right you are basically ransoming your friend's pet and this is not something you can do mechanically but what? But the consequence of this is going to be such. Or when a player says something really hurtful, 
Um, I make sure that there are consequences for the other NPCs or PCs in the scene. So it's about being able to say out of character, all right, you've said this, this is what happens as a result. Um, and also having those conversations at session, session zero or the start of a session or at breaks within a session. Uh, I had one game that was really going really badly because the system just wasn't working. And I just straight up said to the players, right, this system isn't working. Should we just play something else instead? And we re renegotiated what we're playing as a result of that. Um, and yeah, so basically, um, step out of character, talk to your players over the table. That's probably the most effective and most efficient way of communicating with your players. Um, and then there's the other side of communication, which is the game safety side, which obviously um, there are safety tools that I always use. There are safety tools in Mandatory Gears, like the T-Card, which we recommend everyone use. Um, I also try and have lines and veils established from the start of content that we will not go anywhere near. And I make sure I check in with players one-on-one -on -one if something happens that they're not comfortable with. Um, and I also make it clear that players can message me privately if there's anything they want to raise. And I also check in with all my players at the start and at the end of every session. So these are little things that we can do. Um, you know, it's basically just people management skills that we can pick up as GMs to help us communicate better with players. Okay, you made some really good points there. Stephen, how would you best like communicate with your players to ensure that they all understand the story and what's going on and that everyone's happy? Ah. Well, that is that is my weakness, unfortunately, um, because I have Asperger's. I I not communication is not always my, my, my best um, mm -hmm. suit, but so I do my best, uh, basically. Uh, I more or less I do I more or less fo follow along what, with what Vivek is saying. These these tools that he's talking about, they're all very useful, and I have tried to implement them. Um, I always say to my players, "You can say anything to me. I honestly, genuinely won't take offence." If you think my game is crap, say so. Uh, if you want to say it privately, say so. If you want to say it in front of everybody else, say so. If you have any problems, speak to me. I'm not a monster, but I think some people are sh are, are, are shy. And I, I, I have had um, experiences in the past where there have been miscommunications. Like there was a, a game I ran years ago called Aberrant and one of our players got very upset because he came into the game with expectations of what kind of game it was and I'd gone into the game with, a, with an expectation of what I wanted to run and the two did not mesh and that, that flipped him out and he got quite angry with me about it and I said, well, look, I picked up on, up, up on one small plot point like that I read in, in, in the background and I'm, and I'm playing with that. And I, I, I didn't have an answer back then, to be honest. And I wish Vivek had been around then. Or he, he would have been, but he'd been like six or something. <laughs> so <laughs> probably not been very useful. But yeah, if you'd had someone someone like 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 that around then, I, I, I would have been much more useful for me. So yeah, that's yeah. that. So you think I, clear communication is very important then, so everyone's on the same page? I, I, I personally prefer candor and honesty uh, between people and I expect it and I expect it for myself and I expect it for others but what I fail at is understanding other people don't get that so that, that does lead to sort of like toes being stepped on sometimes. Yeah you did say earlier um, about keeping track of sessions you said that you often talk to your players about a recap so during that time as well do you kind of communicate with them and make sure that um, you know, everyone kind of remembers what's happening and just so um, nothing comes up in the plot that suddenly, unless it was meant to be a surprise, like it doesn't surprise someone too much. Um, yeah, I mean, the whole issue of um, red lines in the sand type of thing, yeah, you do have to do that. There's been a lot of games and more recent games which, which flag this up. So I read that and say, okay, I'm supposed to do that. I do that. Um, and for the most part, I, I, I will try and avoid that. I mean, there's 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 a, there's a couple of things I, I I never touch in my games. I never will. Uh, and I mean, and, and certainly when I started my current campaign for Gears just a few weeks ago, uh, I did say these are things I'm not going to touch. I won't I won't do gore. I don't do um, deaths in the family. These are things I don't touch. Okay. And I mean, and ask people, um, is there anything you don't touch? anything you, you want me to avoid and usually people come back with nothing you usually people are like yeah they don't care they don't mind 
But uh... <laughs> if somebody okay. said to me, um, "No, I have a terrible fear of of, of, of spiders, and I, and I can't even bear to talk about it," then my my plans for meeting the the dread spider god go out the window. Mm -hmm. Okay. I mean, it has to. I mean, it's no good. It's not fun if people are are freaking out, are crying, and yeah, getting angry. Yeah. Like that, yeah. like that I mentioned previously. I mean, it wasn't fun having to deal with an angry person. Mm -hmm. um, okay. <laughs> uh, so, Craig, how do you communicate with your players then to make sure that everything runs smoothly? Uh, well, um, much the same. Um, just the one thing I'll add is that <laughs> it is helpful to have um, a way from the table way of doing this, like um, yeah. extra voice chats or emails or communication so that people can um, flag something up that there occurs to them later or that they don't have a really comfortable way of um, communicating at the table itself. Mm -hmm. um, Gaius is, is very good for this because um, it has uh, safety mechanisms uh, outside of the table itself. Um, um, looking out for those, I mean, you know, Gauging how people react at the table is, it can be tricky and it's uh, particularly at the moment when we're not at the table and we're looking at each other in these tiny little boxes. <laughs> um, so yes, it's um, it was good to have uh, another way of doing it for uh, people who will um, sort of mumble and uh, uh, no, it's fine at the time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I just um, also, um, just to acknowledge a suggestion that's come in the chat from Rowan, um, this is a great mm -hmm. idea. Um, so if this is something you're struggling with, you could ask someone who is more socially adept to help you in um, being able to gauge other people's reaction at the table. Uh, it's a great idea, Rowan. Thanks for um, suggesting that. If any of you have any other comments you'd like to make, feel free to chuck it in the chat and hopefully some of us might notice it if we can manage looking at all these windows at once. <laughs> Um, but yeah, one other thing just to follow up on what Stephen and um, Craig were saying is, you know, it's really important for us to be able to communicate, but also, and this is the thing I struggle with the most, is um, having that self-awareness to realize when someone might not be communicating with you. Um, and you can see how difficult it is to clock when someone isn't communicating and, and stuff. And, um, you know, I've realized, for example, if you're in a group of people where everyone knows, knows each other very, very well and you have one or two new people to the group, that dynamic's very different, and that person who is who doesn't know everyone as well might feel quite alienated or put out, and feel more uncomfortable to reach out and communicate. Um, you know, if you are in a group that is very heavily skewed in terms of, in terms of its racial or gender demographic, for example, then the person who's in the minority there might feel intimidated or un uncomfortable or talked over by everyone else. It's really hard to recognize these things, and. Um, it is, it is the kind of thing which we get better at over time through experience as we recognize these dynamics emerge. But that is, again, something that we need to be mindful of and train ourselves to see and recognize in good time so that we can reach out to the person who feels minoritized like this and make sure they, they feel supported and included in the group. Because if you're someone who is an outsider to the group, you need that extra effort in being made to feel welcome and included. And as a GM, we are often in a position of neutrality between players where we can recognize these dynamics and make sure everyone's included. Um, so that's just something to bear in mind, something I personally learned the hard way. I think that's really great to add that there, just so it's definitely, um, I mean, I've not really GM before and you guys have loads of experience. So you'd agree that obviously over time you definitely improve and you definitely pick up on more things than when you start. Yeah? Yeah, absolutely. Brilliant. Okay, so we're going to move on to the next question now. So this question um, is how do you deal with a session when a player is absent? But it's also how do you deal with a session when it doesn't go how you plan it maybe? So if like, you know, you do throw in a key character that you think the, the players might want to go for, but then they go in the complete opposite direction. How would you deal with this sort of situation? Um, Stephen, we'll start with you. Hmm. Um, there's that moment of blind panic, of course. Um, if, if a player doesn't show up, um, well, I usually say to people, let me know uh, mm. beforehand as much as, as much as you can. 
and if and if I have forewarning, then I can deal with it. And basically, the the player is player character is sort of not there mm -hmm. as much as possible. Like I put him in a little safe bubble. It's not, yeah. it's not nice for for someone to have yeah. their beloved character and play it and have to have to leave one session for whatever reason, come back mm. the next week and oh sorry your character died. I've mm. had that done to me. I didn't like it. I didn't enjoy it one little bit after having spent an hour making a character and then had to leave to do something else and then come back and oh yeah we NPC'd your character and he did something stupid. Yeah really great thanks guys. So I would never do that to somebody. So, yeah, if your if your player is not there, you do not you do not kill that character. You do not put that character into danger. What you can do, though, uh, and I often threaten my players with this, uh, as kind of as a joke, uh, yeah. is their character becomes a kidnapped victim of the week. <laughs> <laughs> like, oh, you're you're not there to play a character. Fine, yike, the bad guy is kidnapped, <laughs> and the rest of the players have to go and rescue them. That's kind of fun. Because that a it keeps them sort of in a nice little safe bubble. Mm. Um, they can't. They're not. They're not going to be doing anything with that character. So the character's put in a little box up the shelf somewhere, and then you have to go and rescue them. That's that's quite fun. You can you can you can do that sometimes. You can't. Don't do it all the time. Um, if a player is absent more than once or twice over the course of a see a semester, you maybe want to have a conversation with them about. Uh, their priorities and and so on, and you know, make it clear to them that your your personal life is important, your studies are important, your real life is more important than a game. And if this is it is if this is a situation, then uh, maybe you want want to think about uh, doing that instead of this game. Uh, and that's that, that can be hard, but it has to be done sometimes. And okay. you can quickly pick up on. I, I think sometimes uh, it's a good way of, of um, working out who's actually not that engaged in the system. Some people who um, have a problem with confrontation won't confront you personally. They will just simply not show up. I think that's I think that's some, that, that sometimes happens as well. As they like, instead of saying to you, "Oh, we don't like your game," they'll just go. Okay. Um, so we'll move on to. Vivek, how would you deal um, with a session if a player is absent or if something um, doesn't go according to a plan, if you have one? I mean, I can't remember the last time something actually went to plan. So <laughs> I think dealing with things not going to plan is pretty much par for the course now. Um, in terms of, uh, I mean, in terms of plans themselves, I have vague ideas of what's going to happen. For example, um, I, there's an arc I have in mind that, you know, the, the bad guy is going to make themselves known then the second phase of the arc, the bad guy is going to lay out their trap. And then the third phase of the arc is going to be the big confrontation. That is all the plan that I have. And the details are basically what happens as a result of that. So, um, you know, which bad guy makes themselves known, what exactly their trap is, or what, where does the fight take place? Those are things I don't plan for. So whenever they happen, they happen wherever they need to. So, you know, I'm quite flexible that way. Uh, being flexible is really good when it comes to making plans, because that way you're not thrown off as badly. And obviously, the more experience you have and the more resources you make for yourself in advance, the easier it is for you to improvise and be flexible later on. Like having contingency plans, having lists of backup plans or ideas, those things really help you in the long run. But in terms of player absences, um, you know, I think just to echo what Stephen said, sometimes people, um, you know, sometimes if someone's not able to keep up with the game, it could be because there are things going on um, outside of the game, which um, they might need to be mindful of. And, um, you know, my, my personal opinion of this is, you know, similarly, not to be punitive about this. If someone can't keep up with the game, not to take it personally and let them know that, you know, they, if they, if they don't, if they feel like they can't keep up, they're not obligated to stay. They are welcome to leave the game if they so choose. But I also make it a point to be as welcoming and flexible as possible. So if someone does want to stay with the game, and even if they can't keep up that kind of commitment, I'm happy for them to come and go as and when they please, um, and try and work around that. Because at the end of the day, we're all trying to be friends. We're all trying to, you know, enjoy a game together and work around each other's schedules. Um, so yeah, this just to bear that in mind and you know be flexible and mindful of players' absence because sometimes there might be circumstances that you're not aware of and um, 
Yeah, it's um, and if anyone has any problems that you know in terms of um, things getting overwhelming, any conflict at the game or any difficulties at the table that they need help resolving, um, I am there as the equality and well-being officer to help mediate and uh, resolve any conflict that can arise. And um, um, that's just something I want to flag up to everyone. But in terms of working around the story content, if a player is absent, that gets tricky because sometimes you can have a whole arc planned based on a certain story beat that involves a particular PC. And if that player is not there, that can throw things off kilter. One technique I found to really help with this is make sure that there are multiple different PCs, backgrounds or connections at play. So for example, if there is um, X villain who is the nemesis of this part one particular PC, make sure that that villain has connections to the other PCs as well. So if one PC is missing, then the others can step in and uh, lead the story that way. Um, so yeah, there are ways in which you can adapt and work around players being absent. Uh, but also like Steven, I think it's important to make sure you don't punish a player for them being absent. Because what, what you said, Steven, about your character being killed off in the background, I mean, honestly, that is so out of line. It's just mm. infuriating. And I'm really sorry that happened. It's just that's just like bad genius. It was long. Opinion. It was long, long before you were in gear. And yeah, I've been in gear since 1993. This happened about 1996 or something like that. So long, yeah. long. But yeah, if anyone else has similar experiences, just know that that kind of behavior is unacceptable at gears because that is an undermining of a player's agency in a story, and we don't really allow people to do these kinds of things without the player's consent in their absence. That's just not fair and just ruins the game for people. Yeah. And then, Craig, how do you deal with it when a player is absent from the game or when something doesn't go according to plan? Uh, well, I uh, will, will plot and plan a bit m more than Vivek does, so I will be a bit more thrown. Um, but, um, <laughs> well, normally when we're at TV, it's being able to go to the bar We'll give you five, 10 minutes to think about something. Um, it also helps have uh, backup plans. I mean, you know, it it is okay if, you know, uh, this development is vitally important because of this character and their player um, cannot make it. Um, you know, it is okay to do a filler session and go, okay, this is, uh, we're filming episode 11 uh, tonight and we'll film episode 10 next week. Uh, yeah, so it, it is totally okay to go. Okay, we're we're doing a monster of the week episode. You know, if, if you have some spare monster of the week episodes, you know, this is what they're for. Uh, yeah. Which is um, the more monster of the week the game is, up to the point of the actual game monster of the week, mm. um, which oddly enough has art plots. But never mind. Uh, <laughs> Um, easier that is to do, but um, you know, as long as you know, ultimately, you know, if someone you know says, "Oh, sorry, I can't make it," as a okay, thank, um, and, you know, thank them for letting you know. Being completely ghosted, you know, it can be um, because they're avoiding confrontation, but it, you know, just have to take a step back. That doesn't happen very often. Mm. Just to echo what Craig said, never underestimate the value of a good filler. Like filler episodes can be really important in terms of building relationships and uh, story beats in very organic ways. Um, not everything needs to be part of a grand master plan. And I learned that the hard way because one of the best D&D sessions I've ever run was a session where I literally found out that the session was on 10 minutes before because all my players were waiting for me at TV and I was in the shower. <laughs> I, I basically just got back from a corfball game, saw the text because I was texting everyone saying, guys can't make it today. And then because I was um, going through a tunnel on the train at the time, the text didn't send. So I got back and I realized the text hadn't sent and all the players had already commuted it and were waiting in TV. I'm like, ah, shit. I just sprinted into TV and winged it all the whole way there. And we did a filler episode, which is basically backstory of how the players, the PCs got to know each other. And all the relationship that, relationships that came out of that ended up being a massive story arc in the future sessions. So don't underestimate the value of a filler. Just because something is not part of a big plan doesn't mean it's not fun, it's not valuable, or it's, or it's not going to be meaningful in the long run. Um, and if anyone's curious what this was, ask me later about the um, Constellation Battles story arc. Yeah, I really must get It's <laughs> an amazing. <laughs> Okay. Um, 
And so the final question that we've got is more of like, um, I guess, a basic overview sort of thing when it comes to the basics of GMing. Because it's, what do you think is something that all new GMs should know or be aware of when it comes to running a game? So it could, you could um, echo something we've already said, it could be something completely different. What do you think is something that is very important that new GMs should always know? Um, we'll start with Vivek. So yeah, um, just to echo what I said earlier, the system that you play matters and the system can really facilitate the kind of storytelling and content you'd want to bring up. Um, and I really recommend people at least reading through some Powered by the Apocalypse games because they're a very good masterclass on how to improvise with genre tropes that are part of your story and how to move the story forward in dramatic ways. And the one maxim that I think I'd like to stress for everyone is basically the the first line of GM advice in Powered by the Apocalypse games, and that is be a fan of the PCs. You are there to, you are in some respects the primary audience for all the other PCs because all the players are going to be, you know, playing their character first and foremost and then playing to the rest of the table. You are the one person who is the audience for literally everyone. So it's up to you to make them look the best in the best possible, to show them the best possible light. Uh, so yeah, definitely be a fan of the PCs is the one most important thing that I'd emphasize. Bro, Craig, what would you say is one of the most important things that all new GMs should know? Um, well, uh, there are oh, a lot of games. There are you know games which are literally one page. There are games which are six hundred pages. There are games which are free. Um, you know, um, the first I think ten levels of the first most basic four character classes in Dungeons and Dragons Fifth Edition. You can get that for free. You know, it's it's the perfect uh, free to play. But if you want a you know half dragon uh, warlock, you have to pay for that. But um, you know, you also have to consider um, some games are very narrow. Um, you know, it, a game like Monster Hearts, which is about teenage monsters in high school, is a lot narrower than a game like Vampire, which is also about monsters who look human, but they're not necessarily in high school. Um, and you don't have to include everything. You can narrow stuff down. Like, you know, if I say I'm running a superhero game, that could mean like the MCU, like the Batman the Animated Series, um, like the boys. It will not be like the boys. Uh, but, you know, you, you need you know, to explain which, what idea you're going for, because you'll otherwise you'll get a game like um, Steve's Aberrant game where, you know, the game's expectations completely clashed hmm. you know and I have to be aware that sometimes players will hear i'm running a superior game and not hear the rest of the pitch <laughs> <laughs> yeah. okay and that's where you know um character generation at, at the group um and session zero are very helpful because otherwise you could end up with four one-player games very good bit of advice there and um, Stephen, this is actually good for, but still don't do it. There has to be a reason that the group are actually at the table or at least meeting on Discord or Zoom at the same time. Otherwise, mm -hmm. you, just, you can just one, run a one player game for four different people. But, you know, if you've got four people, they should probably meet. <laughs> <laughs> that is. And Stephen, what do you think is uh, something important that all new GMs should know about? Hmm. Uh, Again, it can be something that we've already said. It's what you think would be um, a really important point for them to know, or maybe what you wish that you knew when you first started jamming. Uh, I, I, so I'm, I'm just trying to like uh, get the mm. words in the right order. Yeah, man. take your time, don't worry. I guess it's important that um, you realise that it's supposed to be fun. Very good point. Um, that it's that it's not about you, the GM. It's about the players. This is this is something which I for a long time. I, I mean, I, I I ran games the way that um, another GM ran them, um, and that was a mistake because it's a, the most important thing is is that the players are in charge of the story. And if you get that in your head from day one, 
and make sure that every player around the table gets a moment in the sun, gets their gets their the feeling that they are important and that what they do matters. That's probably that probably about 95 percent of them making it a positive experience for everyone. And really, it makes it easier for you as a GM because if you can sit back and say, "Right, everybody, play your characters," and then you just sit like quietly take notes and occasionally introduce some kind of complication, um, then that's that's also good. Whereas I'm as a mechanic in the strange, which is what I'm running on Sunday afternoons, called GM Intrusion, and it, it enshrines what all GMs have been doing since the beginning. Anyway, it's basically. It says at any point a GM can introduce a complication into the in, into the plot. So the players are, are walking along, doing doing a thing, and suddenly suddenly a ghost appears, uh, that kind of thing. And it's it's, it's just a... no, I'm not sure where I'm going with that. But <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's basic, basically have fun and be aware of that that the players are the um, protagonists of the, of the story. You're the narrator. Yeah. Yes, Craig. <laughs> um, one thing I'd like to add to that um, is, you know, your game, uh, you have to have fun too. You know, if you're yeah. not having fun, <laughs> then you know, the game will, will also suffer, and so you, you're not getting paid unless you are getting paid. <laughs> there are people who are getting paid to GM, but um, well, I charge hundreds of pounds as a person. <laughs> really. I, I have never been paid to GM, so you know, <laughs> I, I'm, I am doing this for fun too. Well, those are some really good points there. I think like all of them are really good. I definitely know that obviously having fun is so important, communicating with everyone's important, and knowing what you're doing is definitely going to be extremely important because otherwise the game would fall apart, I'm guessing. It's important yeah. to, to look like you know what you're doing. That too, yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, I, mean, um, I don't know what I'm doing half the time, but but the trick is to look like like, like you know what you're doing. So you're like a fake it to make it kind of they're thing. All serene on the surface, but underneath there's a wee leg to the line. <laughs> See, that's where I that's where I differ from Stephen a little bit because mm -hmm. I'd say it's great to look like what you, you know what you're doing at a con when you're playing with complete strangers and you don't know how they'll react. Um, because, you know, um, con games can be hit or miss if you have a player who loves undermining the GM's authority and just being a bit of a prick. Um, mm -hmm. Has happened to me before, will always happen to me again because cons are a mis mixed bag. It helps to fake it till you make it. But at Gears, one thing I found really helpful was the players have always been really in accommodating. Like if I just straight up told the players, right, I have no idea what I'm doing with this. I don't, I'm not comfortable with this system or... I don't know what to do with a story beat. Does anyone have any ideas? Um, the, the players have always been really generous and supportive. And the one thing that I re remember G about GMing is the players are all on your side. Like you're all telling the story. Yes, you're the GM. You often create obstacles for them to overcome. But at the end of the day, you're all on the same side and you want those obstacles to be tough so that the players can look awesome overcoming them. Um, mm. And I love just telling the players straight up, like, I don't know what I'm doing when I don't know what I'm doing. Um, but yeah, obviously not for cons. Cons are a different sport. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I get you, Barbara. That's probably a good idea. Well, okay, so we're going to take a five-minute break now, and then after that, we're going to have Q&A. So if you've got any questions, feel free to put them in the Twitch chat, and we will get them answered. I'm not sure if I can <laughs> see this Twitch chat. Uh, so if it... you go to twitch.tv slash gearslive, it should bring up the Twitch chat. Um, what now? Um, so if you um, go to the website is twitch.tv slash gears live. I'll, I'll post a link on the Zoom chat if you can see it. Okay, it's probably the best thing to do because I don't know what the hell you're talking about. Uh, that's okay. Okay, Stephen. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah, there's so many online platforms to negotiate at once. All right, let's see if that works. All right. Yeah, I'm somewhere now.
Right, okay, yeah, I can see I can see things now. Okay. Do I have to um, log in at all? No, you don't need to, but don't worry about it. We'll, right. um, I'm sure Emma will read the questions in for us to answer, yeah. so don't worry. Okay. Yeah, it's one, it's one of the kind of um, downsides of um, being uh, being the, the old man of DS is uh, you don't get what these young kids are on about sometimes. <laughs> yeah, I'll do my best. Try not to get an old fart too much. A minute. <clears throat> Oh, there's some really spicy questions in the chat. Oh, good. Often to go no comment in uh, some of these questions. <laughs> if suppose. there's any questions that you don't want to answer, that's absolutely fine. I'll say for these um, Q and A ones, if you do want to answer it, if you just raise your hand, and then we'll go there. Okay. Cool. Well. Uh, we'll wait till Stephen gets back, and then we can get started. Mm -hmm. So let's let us know when and where we're good to go, Emma. Okay. Um, is everyone all right if we go on with the Q and A questions now? Yeah, yeah. Go for it. Well, okay. So the first question we've got is: How do you deal with pre-game stage fright? Right. Um, okay. Um, Craig, yeah. If you yeah. want to go. Um, I since I, I mentioned stage fright and the <laughs> it's it's definitely a thing. This is one of the things that um. Uh, preparing to at least some extent is for so you have at least some idea of what to do in the first few minutes 
you know, and you know, going in, sitting down, saying hello to everybody, um, getting a drink, and seeing, you know, getting the, you know, seeing how everyone is, you know, it helps. It it does help that you know you you generally don't have an audience. I mean, sometimes you know you will have someone sit in at the game, which I do find a little odd, just having somebody sitting there in almost total silence. <laughs> but, yeah. uh, but, you know, I, you know, I am very aware that, you know, I, I have turned up, um, there are half a dozen people who expect to be entertained and to uh, take part in the entertainment. It's like, uh, but uh, at least some of it is on me. And I, I, I was like, I can do this. I can do this. I can, I, 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 I can do this. <laughs> um, yeah, but um, having uh, a nice, clear, okay, this is the start of the session thing um, is the statement. Um, the uh, Having a player who is good at that is also very helpful. You know, having, having a player who can turn to the, the group and say, so, uh, I was like, yep, that works. Um, you know, I, um, I have one who uh, once couldn't make it to a session, but uh, sent his text message that said, so, S O O O O O O dot, 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 about half an hour after the session was, was worked. I said, right, yes, I'll start. <laughs> um. Does anyone else have anything? Vivek, yeah. Yeah. So, um, just um, just to add to what Craig was saying, um, um, I find it really helps to talk to my other players if I'm feeling nervous, if I'm feeling tired or exhausted or not up to it. Uh, I my favorite way of dealing with the pregame stage fright when I started out GMing was to ask some of my friends if they could join in the game with me, so I at least had one player I knew I could rely on. If you're a new GM, it might be really helpful for you to hold a space in your game for one person whom you really get on with and whom you can trust to be in your game and help you out. Um, and this could be someone who's familiar with the rules and is just there to, you know, sort of back you up on the rules and help you keep track of that. Or it could be, as Rowan suggested, someone whom you trust to be able to help you manage the other players and keep an eye on other players better and how they're feeling. Um, so yeah, that's that's one one way of that's one way I'd suggest. Um, and the other being talking to your players. And this is something that, I mean, like Craig, I think like Craig implied throughout his, um, what he said today, I mean, he still, he said he still gets pre-game stage fright and honestly, so do I. And I've been jamming for a while. It doesn't go away, but you get better at dealing with it over time. And I think that's the important thing to remember. Mm -hmm. Stephen, do you have anything to add um, about how to deal with pre-game stage fright? Um, usually what I do uh, in entering any new or different social situation is obsessively um, rehearse uh, exactly how I think uh, I'm going to say things and respond to things. Uh, then just where it starts and um, tell myself, no, that's not how, how the real world works and just deal with it. Um, but yeah, every single September, um, when you have a, that, those, first, those first pitches, I'm in and I've got butterflies. You know, it's, it's it's terrifying. Everybody goes. I think everybody goes through it, um, and it's fine because remember that that very first session is session zero, and you're just creating characters. So you basically just sit down and get to know your players, uh, relax, chill out, and get on with it. And then, by the time we come to the next session, where you've created after you created the characters, you've got to know them a little bit, and hopefully, you can relax a bit. But um, yeah, I think that's about it. Mm. But it, it's it's terrifying because you're essentially going in going into a situation where you're meeting potentially six complete strangers. You don't know them; they don't know you. You don't know how you how, how they're going to react to you. You don't know how you're going to react to them. But kind of just have to do it, mm. or not, or not do it, yeah. and then just sit at home on your own, rocking back and forth, making whimpering noises. And that's never good for anyone. <laughs> well, I mean, at Gears, we want the society to be as inclusive as possible to all of our GMs. So if you're GMing and, or you're pitching a game and you're feeling uncomfortable about this, feel free to get in touch with either me as the equality and wellbeing officer or anyone else on the committee whom you uh, feel comfortable talking to. And we'll do whatever we, we can to help you feel supported in 
either pitching your game or helping you with session zero. You know, even if it's something like one of us could read out the pitch on your behalf if you feel uncomfortable speaking in public, or uh, we might be able to give you some quick pointers on a checklist of things to do for session zero, like little scripts like that, that might at least put you at ease to know that you're prepared and you've got this. Uh, we'd be more than happy to help with that. And Gears, I find, has been, for me, a very supportive environment where I felt really supported when I started GMing the first time. Um, and we've tried to keep that going and make this society as welcoming to new GMs as possible. So if you ever feel scared or intimidated by it, A, as the other said, everyone feels that way. B, come talk to us. We'd be more than happy to help you out. Bro? Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Um, the next question we've been asked is, how would you deal with rules lawyers? Um, again, if you just want to answer, if you just raise your hand and I'll come to you. Vivek, yeah? So this is a tricky one because um, one thing I learned the hard way was players who tend to rules lawyer tend to do this, from my experience at least, because they have had bad experiences at other tables where um, they used to rely on the rules as a defense from other players or other GMs um, treating them unfairly. Um, when someone rules lawyers, um, you know, it's about being able to have a conversation over the table, try and see what is really at stake because, you know, no one actually, when someone's arguing with you about um, how specifically to interpret the, you know, great web, the great weapon fighting feat, chances are it's not actually about the rules about using great weapons. It's about what else is at stake here. Um, you know, is it that this combat encounter is particularly high stakes for this PC and is really important the story arc? Or does this player feel like their agency is being undermined by something someone else at the table is doing? Whenever you have a rules lawyer, it's important to be able to recognize that the, the stakes might be different and then to take a step back and just try and talk and see what the actual issue is. You know, if, if for example, you are interpreting the rules incorrectly and this player is correcting you, um, have a conversation around that. Why are you interpreting the rule this way? Is it better for the narrative to do this your way or would it be better to stick to it as written and come to a compromise by just talking out of character about what's happening? Um, and if this becomes a recurring problem, then you know, by all means, feel free to talk to the player before or after a session and just explain that you, you want to run things a particular way. I love playing fast and loose with the rules because I find it more interesting to tell a story rather than do differential equations and expand them to a series to figure out what XP people should be getting. Um, so, you know, um, have those conversations. Um, Alan, who taught me how to GM effectively, he said to me, like the most, I think his answer for every single question I came to him with was, talk to your players out of character. And that's the thing I keep recommending. Um, so yeah, if someone rules lawyers, chances are there might be something else at stake. But you know, having a rules lawyer is a great thing because that means there's someone at the table who knows the rules really well. So you as a GM don't need to think about that anymore. If it's a rules question, just pass it over to this person and say, okay, what does the rule say on that? But if it's someone who's deliberately abusing the rules and taking advantage of the fact that you don't know it and lying to you about what the rules are, that's a hit the tea card, talk out of character situation because that's someone who is acting in bad faith. I have had that happen to me a couple of times at cons where people have lied to me about what the rules have said in their playbook. Um, and yeah, I realized that afterwards and I realized I should have, you know, um, so you should have stepped in there, but I prefer to trust the players and give them the benefit of the doubt. So, you know. Um, does anyone else have any other points on this? Craig, yeah. Okay. Um, equally, there, there are indeed people who are just really, really do like knowing the rules and, um, you know, like having a certain amount of certainty and will go, yes, uh, but this thing on page 403 of this book says this, like, uh, oh, okay. Uh, if you say so. Um, and this applies to the um, setting material as well, um, which is why it's often good to, um, if you're going with a particular spin on something, it's it's good to separate it out. Like, um, I, I know someone who's a, a huge fan of the Star Wars Expanded Universe, and, you know, if I run a Star Wars game anywhere near that, be able to, you know, say, oh, what about this, 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 and this, and this. Like, I have no idea what you're talking about, but cool. Uh, <laughs> uh, you know, um, uh, I don't want to, you know, be down on their knowledge, you know, <laughs> and there's, there's a thing that they care about. And equally, there, there are also people who will just do it. 
to be, you know, uh, shall we say, to do it in bad faith. Um, but, you know, there are people who will do pretty much everything in bad faith. So, you know, that's just something that you have to look out for. I think I've been fairly lucky. I don't think I've had too much by way of rules lawyers in, in any of my games. Partly because I tend to run fairly obscure games that no one else knows the rules for, which is excellent. <laughs> Wait for them yeah. too. Yeah, guys, here's a game that was written before you were even born, and it's out of print. Good luck. <laughs> but no, um, I think it's probably something which which would which occurs in the in the in, in the more well published games like like D and I I have heard of this happening. I know that. At, there, there was apparently a, um, a compulsion about 10 years ago, maybe 10, 15 years ago, there was somebody who sat at the same game table as a friend of mine and basically rules lawyered the hell out of it to a point where it basically the poor GM, who was a relatively inexperienced person at the time, just couldn't do anything and it just it, it killed the game. So, um, yeah, I would, I, would listen, I would listen to Vivek. He, he came up with some clever stuff there. I, I d didn't even occur to me. Okay. Um, and then the next question, still on players, is how would you deal with very passive players or how to encourage shy players? Stephen? Um, I have come across those before. And actually, I can be... I, I can be I, um, Flipping, flopping between, between shy and and extrovert myself. So, what I try to do if I identify a player who's a bit quieter is um, have a conversation with them, find out what they want their character to do, and bring that into the game. Um, some people are just quiet; they just like to sit back and take in all the sights and just like enjoy the experience. Some people are, are just shy. They just they, they don't feel they don't feel like talking to other people or like myself have commu have slight communication issues. Just could identify what the problem is and and address it as best you can. And I realize that sounds fairly glib and facile, but I'm not sure how else to put it. Um, if 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 it's just because they're, they're unfamiliar with you and you and they, and they haven't found their voice yet, then give them time. Give them opportunities. Basically, to to have to, to do something and just just um, let it happen naturally. Yeah, from Vivek. Bit clever ideas. <laughs> Vivek, you were going to say. Absolutely. Um, Stephen's got it spot on. Um, you know, give them time and opportunities because the important thing to realize when someone's shy is they might need a little bit of warming up to get to know the group, get to know the system, get to know the rules, get to know you as a GM. Um, one thing I find really helps is on top of just the time and opportunity, it's also giving them some semblance of context and support. Um, so, you know, it's it's nice to ease players into it. And um, some so there are some techniques which I can recommend, like uh, clearly spotlighting a PC when it's their scene. Because what that means is everyone else has to be quiet and follow what one player is doing. And this can make some people nervous, but for some people it can give them it can give them the time and the space to start acting in ways that they they like. And then to help them with their nervousness, it might help you to do things like give them clear examples of things to do. For example, you know, if you're in a scene, you say, right, so now you are, um, um, your character is locked in a cage. No one else is here to help you. All eyes on you, what do you do? And if they freeze, then say, okay, do you want to try and break through the cage with brute force? Do you want to try and lie in wait for someone to come in and then ambush them? Give them examples of options. And then when they, and help them make these decisions. And then when they make the decisions, turn back on them and say, all right, so how would you interpret this result? And basically ease them into elaborating on what their responses are. And this will get them into the habit of starting to formulate these responses and thinking in the right genre and thinking the right style for the storytelling of the game. Um, and once they get the hang of this, you can start giving them more and more screen time, the more comfortable they get for this. But then it also helps to check in before and after a session. If a player is being especially shy and is feeling uncomfortable engaging, it might just help just, you know, chatting with them before the session, making sure they're okay, making sure 
you know, they're comfortable where they are. So at least they feel warmed up and they feel comfortable engaging with a group of players and talk to them after the session to give them an opportunity to talk about things that might be making them uncomfortable at the table, you know? Are they the only person who doesn't know everyone else at the table? Uh, do they feel uncomfortable because they're the only person of color in a room full of white people? Like that's happened to me loads of times and I felt really uncomfortable engaging in those groups. You know, these are conversations that we can have that might help these players. And then once you have that conversation, you can talk about what you, what you want them to do, so what they want you to do so you can help them engage. Um, so yeah, mostly it, uh, most, I mean, that's mostly it. Um, but, you know, I really find helping ease players into this helps. And one thing that helps is sometimes players get, oh, when they're new to gaming, they can get overwhelmed because they don't know how games work. They don't know that, you know, their character can do X, Y, or Z to get out of a situation or to do something. So it helps to give them those pointers at the start to say, right, these are options that your character can do. And if it's a social scene, I find a lot of people really uncomfortable in social scenes because they think they really have to do the voices and you know properly act out what's going on. It helps to simplify this. Just say something like, okay, role persuasion. What's the gist of what your character says to persuade them? Okay, that's the gist of what they say. Role pers okay, this, now let's role play this scene going well because you've succeeded the role. This goes your way. So now let's elaborate on what your character said or once you've elaborated, do you want to say this in character? Do you want to do a voice or, or something? Just give them those opportunities and give them the examples and context and ask them those probing questions because that really helps people get into the um, rhythm. Yeah, loaded questions are your best friend on this. Mm -hmm. I've just seen in the chat, it's been said as well, recommending starting character creation with the concept rather than the stats. Would you agree with this? Um. Yes. Yeah. I mean, there, there are games for which this is, you know, absolutely how it is supposed to be done. You know, mm -hmm. the, you know, here's the first thing, here is the thing. And, you know, if you go into it with just the stats and there's, you know, however many uh, steps you, you can just make a, a complete mess, uh, which, you know, okay, I've got a character who needs these skills to use this power and I don't have those skills. So, uh, <laughs> which involves the double checking and you know, equally, you know, af after a, a session or two, you can uh, say to players, okay, if you want to rejig something, if, if there's this skill that you haven't used and the skill you found out that you need, you can do that. But yeah, I mean, I the, the concept is very helpful because immediately, so let's, let's say we're doing Star Wars, you know, Okay, somebody, chances are if you leave them alone, um, the, the players will come up with a spaceship pilot, a Jedi, and a big hairy alien who, you know, punches people across the rooms. But if you leave them alone equally, you may come up with a starship pilot, a starship pilot, and a starship pilot. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> so it, it is, uh, see, okay, I mean, how much niche protection varies from game to game. I mean, I'm fighting fantasy. There is no niche protection. Everybody has some skill, some stamina, some luck, and a sword or other weapon. That's it. But equally, there's a game like Leverage, where the five statistics are the kinds of characters you have, which are the hacker, hitter, grifter, thief, and mastermind. And you know, you also have skills for how they do a particular thing, but literally your character class is your skill, is your stat, and the best one you have at that is what you are. Mm -hmm. So you can run a game with five, with five thieves, but um, because they'll probably have the second highest ability will probably be in something different, but uh, you know, you're then running a, a heist game and where doing cons is a bit tricky. So Leverage is a great TV show while we're on the subject. Look it up. It's got great stuff you can steal for gaming. Yeah. Mm. Indeed, take for gaming because um, take directly for gaming because um, John Rogers, the creator, um, has written a, a guide to playing con and heist games in paint. That's amazing. Cool. Just checking. Um, we've got a question here, which is about uh, a player that talks too much when they shouldn't during gaming, how would you deal with um, an over-talkative player? Is that my GM asking, asking that question? Yeah. <laughs> um, 
I'll go ahead. Go ahead. In fact, yeah, go. I mean, just politely tell them that's enough. Just do so politely and say, all right, you know, you've, you've talked a lot. Let someone else have a go. Let someone else speak. Or, you know, find um, subtle and polite ways of interrupting them. And if that, and uh, ratchet up how unsubtle you are, depending on how frequently or how often this happens. And have a chat with them out of character or, you know, between sessions. Just say to them that they're talking a bit too much just to take a step back and let other players have a go. Uh, the point is, don't be punitive or Con or combative with this player, just flag up their behavior and mm -hmm. uh, take a step back and talk about this out of character. Um, because the last thing you want to do is escalate conflict in this situation. Good point. Anything else to add? Um, well, as I implied, I probably am the player who talks too much quite a lot of the time. Uh, and I, I usually say, say, you can tell me to shut up, and I will. Um, as to how I deal with it as a GM, it, it, it is tricky. Uh, I find it very difficult. So, because the problem is, 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 is a chatty player, uh, is, is a person who's coming up with all the ideas, coming up with all the stuff. And so, yeah, I think, I think you, you do need to sort of say to them at a certain point, that's great. What do you think turns somebody else? I just want to acknowledge a great suggestion coming from Rowan in the chat. Um, this is if you're a player who notices someone else being particularly like someone else talking too much. Uh, one thing you can do is step in and make sure that the quiet player gets heard. Mm. Um, and I think it's important mm. to emphasize this because the responsibility of this does lie to some extent at the whole table. I mean, yes, the GM is the exterior person who is nominally facilitating the table and, you know, can notice these things. But as a GM, you've got so much on your plate already in terms of, you know, storytelling, in terms of keeping the rules, in terms of uh, making sure everyone's engaged. Sometimes these little things can slip your mind, especially when some of the players who talk too much are the ones generating the content that you're riffing off of. If you as a player recognize these dynamics of the table, you're well within your right to hit the T card and say, okay, can we take a time out here? I think this person hasn't really got a chance to speak much. Can we just you know, make sure we can hear what they're saying? Or it doesn't even need to be that blunt. You can also be more subtle and just turn around to another player and just say, okay, so what do you want to do in this scene or something? Or I'd like to see player X have a go or something. Um, and yeah, it's important to recognize this because um, you know, when we rely on other people to tell us off and tell us to stop talking, what we're essentially doing is putting the emotional work of controlling the table on other people. And that just makes it harder for other people to engage because, you know, I've been in games where another player has stepped on my toes and rolled over and my role and just talked over me so many times. And the GM turned to me and said, look, you need to start speaking up when this player keeps getting in your way. And I said to the GM, like, I have to do that every single scene. And honestly, it just gets frustrating for me to keep coming in and saying, okay, can, can you stop and let me have a go? It's my turn to do something. It's my scene. Can you not? And having to be that person who keeps having to speak up and just tell someone off just gets frustrating for you as a player. So it's important for everyone else to step in and help because I really wish the GM in that situation had stepped in and asked that player to cool it so I didn't have to do it. And I wish the other players also stepped in and did this as well. Yes, yeah, um, so, yeah. that's an extreme example. Uh, that's, that's, that's awful. I, I don't think I've ever had it that bad, and now I'm worried that I've missed it. Uh, <laughs> um, you are more likely to get a lot of quiet players than a lot of chatty players. <laughs> the best kind are the quietly mad ones. They'll sit, they're not saying very much, but when you do say something, it's brilliant. <laughs> um, just having a look through. So there's another question here. So how do you avoid railroading when pushing the story forward? First of all, does anybody want to just kind of quickly explain what railroading is in case someone doesn't know what it is? Okay. Um, well, railroading is... Um, it's been used rather broadly and rather vaguely, but um, as I understand it specifically, it's meant for uh, when the GM or the presenter is advancing the plot, regardless of what the players are doing, because you know it's staying on rails and it is going this way. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, if you're just advancing the plot, that's just advancing the plot. You know. <laughs> mm. Equally, I've also seen um, from uh, someone who says. Um, 
people are okay with railroading as long as you're going somewhere fun <laughs> and you're having fun on the tracks. Like, uh, which, you know, to a, a certain extent is true. It's, it's a problem when, you know, okay, this, this is going to happen no matter what happens. Okay, we go north, there's a mountain. Uh, we go west, there's a storm. We go east, there's another mountain. But I guess we'll go south then. Good for you. <laughs> yeah, it's, it is tricky. Um, the more conceived ideas you have, the more likely you are to want to use them. But equally, you know, the more ideas you get from from what the, where the players are going and what, the, what they're doing, the more likely you are to go, let's do that. And it also varies with uh, from game to game. There are games where there are sets, very set straightforward structures, and there are games where there is much more of a blank page. And it helps to know what you're doing, and it helps for the players to know what where you're generally going. Like you know, starting out in, in with Dungeons and Dragons, there was a map of a dungeon, and you could go left and you could go right. And left was was this thing, and right was this thing. And at some point, probably not that long into the generation of the hobby, I wanted okay. I've got a much more interesting idea for what's on here. So whether they go left or right, they'll meet that. <laughs> Just uh, called uh, magician's choice, where you know it's actually totally an illusion. And on the one hand, yes, I want you to see the the cool thing that I, that I have an idea for. At the same point, you know, I, we actually really did want to go left. <laughs> and and it is difficult. This, on one hand, you, the players are relying on you to be all five of their senses, um, possibly more than five, and if they're psychic or something. And so it is, uh, it is difficult. It's basically if you are seeing that people are like, no, can can we do that? That, that's when you need to have a conversation about it. Okay, yeah, Vivek? So, yeah, um, there's actually an interesting question because um, in terms of how to not railroad someone, I find that I can't really summarize very succinctly good ways of not doing this because it's, it's just, there's so many things you can do. Um, but I think the fundamental principle, as Craig said, when you railroad something, it's when you know you advance a plot in a very rigid direction that you've already predetermined and the player's choices don't matter. Um, and one thing I like doing is always reflecting on what choices the players can make and how would that have an impact. So, you know, if it's a matter of, okay, do we go north, east, south, or west? I need my players to go south. I'm just going to straight up tell them, right, so you need to go south. Can we come up with a reason or a justification for that to happen? What is at stake in the direction you want to go? And I tell the players what needs to happen, and I get them to find a way to buy into this. Because the direction that they go isn't really the big question here. What matters is what the direction represents, what it costs them to get there, or many other things that the players can come up with. And then to contextualize them going south in the context of what their characters want to do, their drives, their ambitions. And then on the way, make those come into play. So, you know, the characters didn't have a choice in the fact that they're going south. But as they go on that road, different things can happen that will make them grow their characters in different directions. So, you know, that's just like what Craig said, the magician's trick. You are going in one direction. You don't really deviate from that path. But you buy into this illusion. And there are different choices and different directions your character can grow, even though the plot is progressing in this direction. And you have an option and you have meaningful choices you can make to develop your characters. Obviously, while I say give them meaningful choices, it's incumbent upon you to make those choices meaningful. So it's not just, all right, we're going to go south. What's important going south? I have relatives who live in a small village. Fine, we're going to go see those relatives. That re those relatives then need to be plot important. We can't just say, right, we have one session, we met the relatives, now they're never heard of again. The stuff that happened there will never come back to play. That is railroading them again. You need to make their choices meaningful. 
Um, so yeah, that's that's mostly it. Give them choices, make the choices meaningful. That's how you avoid railroading. Yeah, sounds yeah. great. That sounds reasonable. Um, and I usually avoid it by not having a terribly clear idea of what it, of, of what the your destination is. Um, I mean, the, 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 you come you come to the table. You, you have a plan. The, 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 there's a there's a wizard in a mountain. The, the players have got to defeat a wizard in a mountain. And sometimes it's kind of fun just saying to them, there's a wizard in a mountain, you have to deal with them at some point. I mean, let them sort of decide how they deal with that wizard and when. And in between the wizard and everything else, there might be um, an army of orcs, there might be um, uh, an amusing interlude with a barmaid, there might be any, any number of things going on. Um, the trick is that um, as long as you get to the destination, the actual route doesn't necessarily matter. I think. Having said that, yes, I have I have rail railroaded in the past. I have basically blatantly dropped into the game. Here's a clue. Hit you over the head of this clue until you get until you get the idea, because I want you to go in that direction. And honestly, sometimes depending on your players, they kind of they kind of they buy into this. It's part of it of the meta of of the hobby. Is that we expect, we expect it and we go along with it. And it, it all depends on who your players are. Um, the people that I play with on Sunday evenings are middle-aged guys who are like Craig's um, contemporaries. They've been role-playing since um, the hobby first came out. Um, and they expect this. And they, they, make, they make it a joke. They, it amuses them. So, yeah. I, I've also run, run games where um, I had a route laid out, and when the players didn't follow it, I threw a fit. And then immediately after, I was like, all right, that's how not to do things. <clears throat> so, <laughs> yeah, I think, like, yeah, Stephen's raised some really uh, interesting points there. Um, you're absolutely right, Stephen. Um, you know, it's important for us to recognize that there are some times when railroading is appropriate, like when there's filler and you just need to advance a plot. Sometimes it can be helpful to railroad. Um, it can be helpful to railroad a plot uh, the plot a little bit, um, but uh, but you know, like I said previously, railroading. I mean, it's a trade trade off between the player's agency and the way the story is going. Uh, if you railroad the story just to advance the plot and to get to something interesting, I think that makes sense. But if you railroad the story in a manner that undermines player agency, that's when things get problematic. Mm. So one way of dealing with railroading is just recognizing the few circumstances where railroading might actually make the story better and be appropriate for the situation and recognizing the few circumstances where railroading is undermining player agency and you just should avoid it. Yeah. Fair points. Um, I've just seen in chat, someone said, if you need to railroad all the time, make sure you've got a setting to allow it. Um, so let's just see. It's like starting the game, having woken up in a dungeon and still allowing choices. Would you guys agree with this? So you put them in a scenario where there's a certain route that they have to follow in order to advance further. Then, yeah. oh, you're, this is this is like like the, the Elder Scrolls version of railroading. You wake up in a jail, you have to get out of jail. Is that is that what you're talking about? I think so. I'm just trying to read the chat. Yeah. The characters are captured. Yeah. It's one of the classic <laughs> railroading things. Yeah, and you know. We've all seen the cutscene in a video game where you know someone is surrounded by five mooks and um, they have got they have pistols. And it's like, oh, I surrender. Like, no, you just killed eighty-five of them this level. <laughs> but no, they they want to do a a level where the character has has no weapons and has to escape. Like, mm -hmm. Fine. Well, my favorite um, alternative to railroading is we cut to after the cutscene's over. Yeah. We don't need to railroad because you know what? Let's just skip ahead to when when we're done moving through the forest, or let's just skip to when we're already out of prison because that's not interesting. There are ways in which you can skip ahead and circumvent having to railroad things. Because if you need to railroad to get the story to some place, you just as a table can agree we are there. You just mm -hmm. skip ahead to the action. Um, so yeah, I find that one that's a good way of getting around this this particular problem. Um, 
yeah. um, negotiating um, to take the job. You know, I, yes, absolutely. Um, you are, as a player character, entitled to not take this job. But I bought this adventure, um, and it's the start of the session. <laughs> <laughs> Just yeah. checking through. Sorry, continue. Yeah, so, you know, just ask your, like, if there's something you need to railroad, just tell your players and talk amongst yourselves and figure out where you need to be. Um, I think I did that the wrong way once because the first game I ran, I just railroaded my players when I needed, to, needed them to get someplace. And by railroad, I literally meant they did something. Oh, as you did this, this also happened. And now this is happening. Um, Basically, I regret doing that because that's a clear example of the player's decision clearly didn't matter in what was going to happen. Um, but a much more sensible way of doing that, in my opinion, is, um, right, we need to get X, Y, and Z to happen. Like You need to find these documents somewhere. What do you want to do to find them? And if you just have that conversation out of character, get the players to buy into it, then it's fine if you railroad them because they'll they'll have bought into it and they'll they'll be fully aware of what they need to do. Um, and when they know that some decisions won't matter because they've agreed to have this larger thing happen, they won't feel that put out by being railroaded as opposed to when they walk into something expecting all of their decisions to be meaningful and then suddenly to realize that they're being railroaded by the rest of the group. Um, so yeah, that's those are some ways of doing that. Mm -hmm. Um, if we move on to the next question, I think from what I've seen, this is the, oh, we've got another one as well. This question um, was from earlier and it's assuming the players are okay with it. Would you have any advice on making games spookier? <laughs> Part of me thinks this might be in prep for tomorrow. <laughs> Yes. If yeah. any of you are interested in GMing, then you're more than welcome to submit games to the Halloween one shots. Yes. Um, I'll post the link in the chat and um, we will extend the deadline for people to submit games till after the workshop. So we give people time to submit games. So don't worry about that. Um, does anyone else want to answer whilst I type the link up in the chat? Um, well, the main thing I do for, for atmosphere, but just speaking is, is talk and the rate a bit less and consider your words more carefully. Like uh, when I'm running a sort of lighthearted monster of the week type game, I won't but ramble on and, um, but when I'm running a game where things are sort of possibly dangerous and a bit sinister, I will lessen my description and ease it back a bit and uh, talk a bit more slowly and more purposefully. And I realize that I'm now putting on a deep, sinister voice. Uh, a deep, sinister voice is not required, but uh, <laughs> I'm very aware that this microphone is encourages the deep, sinister voice use. <laughs> hey. Um, yeah, I'd agree with that. Uh, it's a it's a tricky one because it it, it, it comes back into um, not triggering people. You've got to be careful of that. But um, as long as as long as that's understood, you can get a guy just um, less is more. Mm. It's like. Um, I'll come. I'll I'll, I'll refer to, to um my my current campaign. There's a there's a bad guy in it, who is literally silent. He doesn't ever speak. Uh, and the and the players are witnessing his actions. And they're alien and mysterious and strange. And I never explain too far what he's doing or why he's doing it. It's just like it, let them. Do, do do the work for you because their imagination will 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 fuel a whole lot more strangeness than you could ever come up with in your lifetime i think would you agree craig yeah um in a what is essentially a conversation as things are uh, silence is a interesting tool um hmm. and having a, a silent character that's yeah, that is, that is a very interesting idea. I've had um, characters who say very little, 
you know, and so that which gives me time to make to think of cool things for them to say. <laughs> So one thing I'd add to, add to that is um, um, if you can catch the um, the Freshers Week live stream we did, uh, Alan's got a very good example there of how to go about negotiating this tightrope, um, where there was one time when Alan was having a description that was meant to be very horrifying, um, and I X-carded the scene, and within the same sentence, Alan swerved and avoided the theme in question that we were avoiding. Um, and he still found a way to make it horrifying and terrifying in, in, to the same degree. So that's one a good example of responding to figure out the level that players are okay with and then changing, changing the tone to what's suitable if a player indicates they're not fine with it. And the way to make these things on, like, you know, slightly scary, I agree with what Stephen and Craig said, um, less is more. And... Um, there are ways to make things spooky that can be really subtle, like just getting sense, like different senses to be inconsistent. So something like, oh, you see, you know, bright lights and candles, you feel a strange chill in your fingertips, or, um, you know, you get the smell of something burning, but everywhere around you, it's just a nice, pleasant evening in a room. Just inconsistent senses like this will allow players' imagination to start filling in the gaps and starting to speculate about what it could be that's causing this diff this um, uncanny sort of difference. Uh, and those are like little techniques that I picked up. And um, a lot of good horror and spooky themed games are very good at giving you this kind of um, advice. Um, so look up the GM advice section in a lot of games. They'll be very good at giving you this kind of, um, giving you tips on how to do this. Also, a useful clarification from Robin in the chat that horror is so spooky and horror are very different things. Spooky is about atmosphere where violent action begets, uh, whereas violent action begets horror. Um, and um, yeah, so to avoid gratuitous violent descriptions but, and focus on the feeling. And actually, that's a good point. Focusing on the feeling, like the sensory experiences and the inconsistencies between sensory experiences can be a good way of making things spooky. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, um, oh, sorry. No, Did someone want to add I, anything? I was just going to uh, back that up. So yeah, <laughs> I prefer psychological horror to actual um, blood and guts horror. It's much more terrifying. And I'm just checking the chat here. I think the last question we have for now is how do you judge how much content you need for a one shot? So how not to run too long or run out of a story too quickly? Like, what would you suggest for this? Okay, um, I have, well, you know, having years of, of doing one shots, I'm still, it, it can trip you over. Um, it helps to have something you can pull out. Um, uh, okay, we don't need this, the fourth fight scene can just go, you know, if we're, because it's probably better to end a three-hour session after two and a half hours and finish, then to end of three-hour session half an hour from the end. We will we'll be happier to have spare time than to uh, be, and we burst into the room and oh shit, we've run out of time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, having uh, and pacing is always tricky because you are one of the people setting the pace. You're not the only one. Um, you, you can do the most to set the pace um, of any individual, but not more than everyone put together. Yeah. So you have uh, some stuff spare, um, so that you know, if you're running really fast, OK, um, we can add a, a fifth fight scene. <laughs> <laughs> Vivek, were you about to add something there? Yeah, yeah. I mean, <laughs> what Craig said is great. Um, having modular stuff that you can pull out really helps. Um, and one thing that I've become increasingly aware, it's especially in the style that I run games, I keep telling myself, you want to run a one shot? Take your one shot idea. No, less than that. No, less than that. Cut it shorter. And that's what you run with because I end up creating too much content anyway. Uh, but it depends on how you prepare and plan sessions. 
Um, so one thing that I find really helps is if you have less content, you can speed up, or you can slow down what you're doing and spend more time on subtle details, take breaks in the game so people can get themselves a drink and do those things to make up for time. So having less content for a one shot is never that big a problem because you can slow down the running of the game to make sure everyone's having more fun than being on the other end of the problem or having to ram through scenes very quickly just because there's more content waiting. Um, and in terms of one shots, I think short stories are a great idea for me because in terms of narrative structure, they're a good example to follow. There is one major narrative plot point and all the story beats lead up to that. Then there's a big climactic moment and then we deal with the short aftermath. Um, and that's a good arc to bear in mind. It's not a, sh a one shot is about one specific thing that is very much self-contained. You know, it could be your one shot is here's a mystery. Um, there's a, mur a murder has happened. You need to find a c serial killer. That's your one shot. And then the big climactic event is you apprehend the serial killer. You have a showdown with them. Everything leads up to that. Everything else that follows it, do no more from that. Um, if you structure everything around just one clear concept and you cut out anything that is tangential, then that normally condenses the material really well. And if you have too little material, you can always stretch it out by slowing down the pace of the game because it's easier to slow down the game and expand the content you have than it is to speed things up and rush through and cram an awful lot of content to a limited amount of time. Okay, so with that, we've basically got, if it's going too long, you can take some things out or maybe adjust the one shot so that you do have a way of kind of adapting it so much so that maybe one plot point isn't as important as the rest of the one shot. Mm -hmm. And then for any games that are too short, extend the time by drawing out smaller, finer details and encouraging more breaks, was that? Or was yeah. it more like um, kind of just talking through the story a bit more? Yeah, both actually. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. I'm just checking through the chat. I don't think we've got any more questions from that. Um, yeah. Is there anything um, that you have been talking about from this Q&A, which you think is a good point just to highlight again or just to maybe mention one more time? Mm, I mean, nothing besides the stuff I've already covered. Mm -hmm. um, but I'd be curious to hear in the chat if people have, um, uh, you know, if, if there are any ideas that people have or any question they have about specifically running games at Gears that they want us to talk about, because we'd be happy to cover that as well, not just the mechanics of GMing, but also running games at Gears or uh, any ideas they might have. So if anyone has any ideas, feel free to post it in the chat as well. Okay, I've got a question then. So this is less about um, how to run a game. What was your first experience like? Like, what was the first game that you ran at Gias, and how did you like react to it? Um, so the first game I ran at Gias was a campaign using Cthulhu Dark, which is a rules light investigative cosmic horror game. Um, it's not a great game to start out GMing because it doesn't give you the kind of support structures that a lot of other games give you. Um, but yeah, my reaction to it was interest. Like it was challenging because I ran the game um, th that was meant to be a mystery investigation, and I made a lot of mistakes in terms of how I railroaded the players, in terms of how badly I handled the niche protection of the characters, and um, and the way I handled some of the story beats. Um, but you know, I made a lot of mistakes doing that, and I learned from all of those mistakes. So um, yeah, I guess my reaction was the first game I ran was a massive challenge because of just how complicated it was. But the mistakes I made running it, um, I learned a lot from that. And I was really grateful to have like other GMs, experienced GMs to talk to and exchange ideas with. Well. Okay. Um, I had uh, previously been running uh, games at another society and it was, um, well, there was um, inter-society politics. Uh, let's just say that. Uh, <laughs> and... I thought, okay, um, and the specific group that I was in at the time, um, two of the four of them uh, were, were married and they were um, just going off to have a baby. So suddenly I had at most two players. I was like, okay, I think I will um, go off to Gaius, which for one thing means getting one less bus equally. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
And I also knew that um, I, I knew a couple of people there who would be up for the game that I was um, interested in running, which, um, but, okay, I will go and run this game here. And I duly got to a group of players and I ended up running said game for five and a half years, which is um, longer than I had ever run anything, including when I was GMing at high school and literally had a captive audience. <laughs> and, and the game went great. And, um, you know, some, some players bounced off it very, <laughs> very quickly, but, you know, essentially in the core, core group, yeah, five and a half years. Um, it helped that I had very enthusiastic players, um, and it helped that um, the game in question, which was uh, Puppy the Vampire Slayer, has uh, a kitchen sink you can throw in any nonsense that you can come up with as a Monster of the Week episode, and it'll work. Which is why at one point I did the uh, adventure where the where two of the characters discovered that they're actors in a TV show. <laughs> and, Having, having prepped this with the other players, that they would go along with it and they would uh, be playing the actors <laughs> rather than their normal characters. Which is the sort of thing that you can only do in certain games, obviously. <laughs> right, so that, yeah, um, so, yeah. Or and that, or as, as long as the show itself had actually run, I thought, Okay, I should probably come to a conclusion here. Um, and also because I'd set it um, to run alongside the, the show, and at the end of the show, the, okay, the characters were uh, trainee watchers who are the uh, a knowing and lore keeping monster hunters who guide the Slayer and other ways to fight evil. And in the end of, in the middle of season seven, they Pretty much get wiped out. So you know, okay, okay. If I'm running this game for uh, seven seasons, I'll have to deal with that. And then I did. I was like, oh, okay, we'll do that. Then. <laughs> um, the player characters did not get wiped out, although a number of people they knew, including some of their parents, did. I suppose. Actually, one of the player characters um, did get killed by a falling library, but. <sighs> So yeah, um, that uh, was very, very surprising because, you know, it's okay, this game has now run twice as long as anything I've ever run. I normally run games for about a semester. So, uh, so the uh, current gear setup of you repitch every six weeks, it helps with some games and it can be an issue with others, um, depending on how long the game runs for, because you know, I my, my current game, it took a session and a half to do character generation, so I'm hoping I won't have too many people um, switch out. Yeah, I hear you. That was rambly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I've... Stephen, what was the first game that you ran at Kiyas then? Um, well, it's a very long time ago. Um, I believe, if my memory serves me correct, it was a modified version of DC Heroes. But it wasn't set in the, in the DC universe, it was set in the Wild Card universe, which was what George R. R. Martin wrote before Game of Thrones. Well, him and a bunch of other people. So it's basically George R. R. Martin is actually a role player. And when he was like a kid, him and his mates played a game called, I think it's called Super World. Um, and then they took those characters and they made them into um, a series of books. And I read those books obsessively. Well, this is a great idea, and adapted the DC Hero rules to, for this. So what I actually had was, a, was a, a kind of random table. When you created your character, you, you rolled to see whether you were an ace or a joker, i.e. Um, a useless freak or a guy with cool superpowers. And um, I ran it with three or four people that I knew from games that I played in. Um, I think Lemon Fresh Phil was in it. Um, Gareth Young, guy called Andrew, many, 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 many people called Andrew bred here, and uh, a couple of hours. And I ran that for a couple of years, and it was this big sprawling campaign, and it was set in Edinburgh, so like Leaf was Joker Town, where all the freaks lived, because that was funny, because I live in Leaf. 
And um, that went quite well. And eventually it was run out of steam and moved on to something else. But I mean, that was probably a couple of years in because I, I when I first came to Gius, it was initially as publicity officer liaison for a, a LARP group. So um, they, my, my, said, like, my masters had, had, had said to this poor little golem here, go there and infiltrate these weirdos and see what they're up to. And I was like, oh, okay. And then I decided, no, they're actually much more fun than you guys. <laughs> um, yeah, that's probably it. Okay, I'm just checking through some of these questions. Um, I don't think this one is for jamming really, but it's about, is it possible to have a music bot for the Discord server? I'm trying to think, did we... We How try it. It's a bit tricky. Uh, it's a bit tricky because only one person can use a music bot at once, which means mm -hmm. it's it's not something we can implement cleanly because different people might end up getting the bot to switch between channels. It's not something we can do conveniently. So unfortunately, it's just yeah. Apparently, because we tried this in my last session, apparently you can share a link with Spotify ah, and get music good. that way. That's 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 now, a good tip. I'm not sure how to do it. Um, if a person who told me how to do it comes onto the chat and tells everybody else how, how to do it, that would be great. But effectively, you go into you you you're running Discord. You go into Spotify. It'll ask you if you want to share. You click share, and then somehow through technological magic, um, your players get to hear your your soundtrack. Yeah. Which I was like, what? <laughs> also, kind of, yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Carry on. No, I was just going to say also, um, the reason we haven't been able to update the roles on Discord is because we are running this workshop just now, so we're kind of busy, but we'll update that shortly after the workshop. Don't worry, we'll let all the GMs know when their games are being created and stuff. And then I think, so how many current one shots have we got planned? I think as it stands, we've got seven submissions. I think we've got eight. Oh, cool. Hey, that's. I don't know what any of them are. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think they'll be posted tomorrow, yeah. right? Well, yeah. I was going to do them tonight, but I want to give a little bit more time for people who want to submit a game yeah. after coming to the workshop. I, yeah. Like I probably should. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, so yeah, if... the best way, I'm st I'm still I'm still in the process of, of designing the game I'm going to be running tomorrow. So. Yeah, that's how hardcore I am. Right. Yeah, I, I want to run a game. I can't be arsed at reading a book. I'll just design my own one. <laughs> uh, yes. Um, I uh, I once came up with a concept for a game based on a, on, a, on, a, on a very silly pun a friend and I made when we were having lunch during compulsion. And... Um, Oh, uh, that was great fun. Um, I, I I adapted a lot of my PhD research into making that game. And my super when I told my supervisor mm. about this idea, my supervisor was like was giving me the weirdest look ever. But he was still, um, you know, helpful enough to say, "Yeah, go ahead. That sounds that sounds weird, but I'm not going to stop you." So, I wonder if it was similar to to the look that I was on the face of the interview panel when I went for an archivist job and tried to argue that. Um, um, bards and archivists are the same thing and sort of use D, &D rules as a <laughs> illustrate with <them>. a <laughs> bit. Didn't get my job, <laughs> funnily enough. Is, is, is there anyone else who's now been inspired by this GM workshop and is considering submitting a game for the one shots tomorrow? I mean, I think so, because we had some really great answers from you guys. And we also had questions about how to, you know, differentiate between spooky and horror and everything about atmosphere. Mm -hmm. So there should be. Cool. Well, yeah. um, if any of you are interested in GMing, I started GMing at Gears, and Gears is a great place to start. And everyone's really helpful. So strongly recommend it. I don't see any more questions in the chat. So I think... That might be us done then. I um, just want to say thank you to everyone who came along and watched the GM workshop. And a big thank you to the GMs who volunteered their time to come and answer a bunch of questions. Thanks um, so much. Thanks so much, Emma, for like moderating this so well. It's been mm -hmm. great fun to have you put all those questions to us. And thanks for coming up with such great questions as well. 
it's yeah. fine and i just want to reiterate what robin's saying in the chat that yes is great and we're not a cult you swear no no we are a cult <laughs> but and that's, and that's in cults we are not as a whole a cult <laughs> <laughs> okay um so i'm going to stop the live stream now thank you all for coming so much <laughs> thank you all so much Thank you all so much for coming. It's been great to see you here. And thanks for putting up with this live online workshop as well. Um, okay. See you tomorrow, folks. Bye. Okay. Bye. Bye. Right. Now what?